You're listening to Content Logistics, a podcast for B2B marketers looking to build a content engine that drives revenue. In each episode, Camille Trent interviews the marketers behind the best content marketing flywheels and uncovers the tactical aspects of content production from first draft to first customer. Hello and welcome to another episode of Content Logistics. I'm your somewhat congested host, Camille Trent, and this episode is brought to you by my friends Tristan and Justin over at Motion. They help busy B2B tech marketers like me, probably like you, launch podcasts like this. So if you are launching a podcast or you have a podcast, but it's overwhelming you on the back end, on the production side, definitely give them give them a shout. Number one thing I can say about them is there's just no handholding. I don't have to point them in the right direction of what good content looks like or the right clips. Um, they can kind of suss that out and they always come up with something good. So the production quality is also top notch. I definitely recommend them. This episode is with Steve Toth. He's a friend of mine, also a very talented SEO. And he led SEO at FreshBooks and is responsible for a lot of the growth on their site. And one way he was able to do that was through people also ask questions. So at one point, his boss came up to him, asked him for a thousand articles in like three months. And he had to come up with a good way of doing that that would drive relevant traffic, that would drive business results, and came up with people also ask framework to do that. So without further ado, I will let him walk you through that. Steve, I'm super excited to have you on. Long time follower and obviously like we work together and big fan. So SEO, SEO is kind of a hot topic and you're seeing all the LinkedIn posts of SEO is dead and other people being like, no, like that's how, that's how I grew my business. It's, SEO is everything, right? So it's very polarized, but I think it's safe to say that it's definitely more saturated than it was 10 years ago. And so if you are going to do it, you have to really know what you're doing to get traction there. And it's harder to get traction there with all of the saturation. So bringing you on to talk through how do you find like blue ocean opportunities in SEO when it's become like more of a red ocean game at this point. So do you see that as the number one problem like with SEO today? How do you see the landscape? How are we going to fix it? Yeah, so um, thanks for having me on, first of all. And I think the one of the issues with SEO is that it's just a lot harder to succeed today than it was 10 years ago. And even before that, um, there was a lot of spam that would typically be able to get you to page one or even position one. And now it's a much more complicated game than it once was. And I think, you know, not everybody knows that going in. And there's a lot of people who have failed because of that. And that's where you kind of see a lot of naysayers coming to the fore, right? So there's always going to be those people who've had, you know, tremendous success, those companies that have really crushed it with SEO. But, you know, then there's going to be even more of them that have failed and have wasted money because it also takes a ton of patience. And if you don't have that patience or the right person guiding your strategy, you're probably going to fail. And then with regards to like, you know, finding the opportunities for, for new sites and stuff like that, you know, there's most topics on, on the web now have, you know, more than 10 articles. So more than 10, you know, pieces of content ready to, to rank for them. So, you know, it's difficult to find, you know, those untapped opportunities, I would say for most businesses. When you're talking about things like affiliate marketing, there's always going to be like some niche that's new and emerging that you can write about. But when it comes to like businesses, B2B SaaS or, you know, B2C consumer products and stuff, most of those have already been saturated. But, you know, when you're looking at competing in a, a landscape like that, you're probably looking at a one to two year effort. Nice. Okay. I'm those scene for people too of like level set, it's going to be a year or two, like before you see the efforts, so that doesn't mean that's it's, it's not happening and that it won't happen, but you need to make sure that you have the strategy in place and like the technical team, cause it has become more technical to, to find those things. So let's go into some of the, the tactics though. So what are some of your favorite tactics for finding those blue ocean kind of opportunities? Yeah, I think, you know, when it really depends on whether you're starting out with a new site or an established website, but one of the, you know, most successful strategies that I've had personally is mining the people also ask questions. So those are the 
accordion menus that appear on the search results when you type in pretty much any query nowadays. So Google is trying to really guess the intent or guess the you know, possible other questions literally that people are also asking and trying to make your search experience that much shorter and more efficient. So actually targeting those questions can be extremely valuable because people don't always know what they're searching at the beginning and Google's actively trying to funnel people into the answer that they want. So if you look at things like the auto suggest, it's trying to push you into a certain set of quality search results. And same thing with the people also ask, it's trying to get you those very tightly related answers to the question that you initially may be asking, right? So just tactically, people also ask questions. You can mine those with a tool called SEO Minion. If you just go to seominion.com, you can download the Chrome extension and literally expand 200 people also ask questions and copy them to a spreadsheet in one click. So the, you know you can start to get a ton of interesting topics with that. And you can then take those URLs that are ranking for those people also ask questions and put them into Ahrefs, Ahrefs batch analysis to see which of those questions, which of those pages gets a lot of organic traffic and try to go after those. You can also like when you run those through Ahrefs, you can tell like, hey, this is a very like young site that's ranking for this, that's getting a ton of traffic for this keyword and, you know, sort of try to seize those opportunities. You can also take those, and I'm going really down sort of the tactical wormhole here, but, and right off the bat of the podcast, of course, but, you know, you can take those questions and then run them through a keyword clustering tool like keywordcupid.com. And what that will do is it will Google each one of those questions and it will look for similarities in the search results. And when it sees search results for different keywords being similar, it's going to suggest that you group those keywords together in one piece of content. So it's a really efficient way of clustering, you know, those types of question based keywords on mass. Nice. Okay. That was super tactical and it was really helpful. We'll make sure to like break it, break it down for folks too, mainly for me, but also for the listeners. Okay. So number one thing I'm going to, I'm going to go back up to like who this is for to start with. So like who could benefit the most from this? Is this a play that you do like when you're first starting with clients with like a zero domain, zero content, or is this something that you do like later on in the SEO process? Like tell me where this fits in terms of type of company you're using this for and then when you're using it. Yeah. So I primarily work with B2B SaaS companies as, as my, um, I would say 80% of my portfolio for my, my client work. And, you know, what we do is we obviously have like the main keywords that we know that we want to rank for, right? So those are going to be very specific to each company, but they're going to be obvious. These are the ones that you spend money on with paid search, right? And we definitely want to produce content for those main keywords and create a page that's well optimized and meets the intent of when you search those keywords. And the thing with SEO today that is a lot different than it was, you know, in the past is that you can't really just rank with one page anymore, at least in my opinion, unless you are some massively authoritative website, right? Like, I don't know, New York times or something, but you know, what you have to do is you have to teach Google that you're also an expert on the related topics to that main keyword, right? So that's where those people also ask those auto suggest keywords really start helping you build that trust and that relevance. And then once you're sort of secondary and tertiary content around that main topic that you're going after, start to rank and start to gain trust. That's when your other, you know, more important so-called money pages are going to start to rank when Google trusts everything that you have to say about that. Right? So you know, just to also go in one direction, not a specific question that you asked, but when you're talking about like, how do you rank, like what actually, you know, makes the difference, right? In my view, you know, if you have content from one, one page and versus the other page, and that content is very similar, the links that you get to that content are the thing that's going to jump you to page one, because, you know, Google doesn't know how to differentiate between one very similar content and another. 
And then once you're on page one, it pays more attention to the engagement of your content, right? So are people landing on your page, getting the answer that they want, or are, are they bouncing or are they not scrolling far enough? You know, are they not clicking links on those pages? That kind of stuff. Yeah, no, I think like the thing that jumped out to me is you're basically just trying to, you're trying to set your site up as a thought leader, right? You're trying to say like, I am like the thought leader in sales processes or whatever it is, like the specific like niche that you want to be known for. And you probably with a, a zero, you know, DA type site, can't just say, I'm going to own sales. You know what I mean? I'm going to be like the leader in sales. You probably have to start like pretty, pretty narrow and like, see if that is sticking like the, this idea that you own sales process. And that's like the whole, you know, cluster, cluster approaches. You're trying different clusters and you're trying to set yourself up, up as an authority. And I see this people also ask as a similar thing, right? Is literally p other people are asking these similar things. Like we know, we know that they're related topics. And so if we can cover off on all of them, then we answer the searchers, like every question. And hopefully like that will drive more links too, because we're seen as an authority. We're answering all of the possible questions that you could possibly have around this. And if you think about it in terms of, you know, comparing this to social of, or comparing it to just your website, like, are you going to trust the, the website that has zero social proof and zero quotes, you know, if there's similar content, there's, you know what I mean? They're, they're selling the same exact thing, but you have one one website that has all these the social proof and G, G2 badges and, and things. The same thing with social. You see like uh, someone that's been saying the same thing over and over again. Like you see them now as like a thought leader in that topic. So applying those same things to SEO. Did I get that right? Yeah. I mean, if you look inside like Google ads, right, they have ways of categorizing your site, what it's about, right? So you know, if they're looking at a site that's a Salesforce software, then they're going to know that you're talking about sales, you're talking about Salesforce, you're talking about all these different things that are in, in a category. So, I mean, that's another reason why you should remain focused with your content um, on your website so that Google, which is just, you know, a, a robot program, understands, you know, what your site is about. And then as you as you begin to publish that content, that's all very focused around that, you know, one or two key core areas, you know, once that content starts to gain, obviously it has to be great content, but once it starts to gain traction, you know, Google starts to promote the rest of your content because it trusts the experience that you've given users with that, you know, lower volume content that maybe there's less competition or um, it's going to trust you more. Um, there's actually a theory called the SEO avalanche theory, which basically says that at the beginning of a site's life, you want to go after those like zero and 10 search volume keywords, win those first. And then as you start to accrue more traffic, you basically work your way up the search volume. Yeah, it, it, you, I mean, you see that with SEO in general, like the snowball effect, right? Like of, of it. Uh, you, you're seeing like those impressive like graphs, you know, where they just like skyrocket up. But yeah, but and it's but it is kind of like that slow build, and it's it's harder to see that in the background because you don't were, necessarily see it on the chart on the charts, right? Were you were you taking a look at my LinkedIn profile with those graphs or what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, only only your profile, like no, no one else is sharing. Yeah. That. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's it's true, like, and it's. The thing that I was thinking when you were talking is that's marketing in general, right? Is it's a combination of like focus and showing up every day, right? And so like the, the accumulation of, yes, like we're still talking about sales. We're still talking about sales. You know what I mean? We're still talking about processes, whatever it is, like doubling down on that and just spoon feeding Google. Like you, like you said, Google is actually not, not a human. We think of it as just like this overlord, like this, like God, but in some ways, dumber than us like it's a it's a program right and so like you have to be like very clear with your intentions whereas if you're talking to a human like you can be nuanced and like you know you can talk about what you did last weekend and then you can go back and talk about yeah, what you know what i mean exactly. and, and people generally understand like what you're about and who you are because we we get nuanced but google doesn't understand like nuance as much so you really have to like be annoying and like hammer home no like we're still talking about this like we're definitely an expert in this and so making it as obvious like as possible yeah i can't name the site but um there is a site in uh that i pay close attention to it's actually like in the 
this is kind of random, but it's in the mattress industry, which is an extremely competitive industry for SEO. And this site had a meteoric rise, like huge rise. And they got penalized so hard that they went from like, I don't know, 20 K traffic down to nothing, down to zero. And then I noticed like a few months later that they started to climb back up. So they literally did like a roller coaster dip. And when I analyzed what they actually changed, they ended up deleting a bunch of content that went away from their core topic. So they were, you know, talking like their core topic was about like sleep, sleep hygiene, mattresses, like pillows and stuff like that. But they also started talking about things like, um, di you know, like uh, diets or like shakes and like kind of going on the periphery of healthy living. And that actually ended up hurting that site a, a lot until they deleted that content and started to make a recovery. Nice. Okay. So when, when it dipped though, did it dip because they were deleting that stuff or did it, did it dip because Google was like, we're, we're changing the way that we, that we rank things and you're all over the place. So we don't know what to think about you. Yeah. I think it was the December, 2020 update that hit them. Yeah. And, and they, and they just went from like hero to zero and then made that miraculous recovery after they, they did two things. So they deleted all that extraneous content. And then they also added more sort of trust signals to their author profiles reviewed by uh, medical experts and that kind of stuff. And those are the two major things. When I look back on archive.org and compare the site as it was prior to um, that update and post that that's what really changed. Interesting. Okay. No, that's a helpful, helpful background. Okay. So I feel like people understand SEO, like why people also ask, like might, might be the play. If you are starting out, especially, and you're just looking for opportunities when everything seems like it's already been done and it's already been done fairly well, this could be like the play to find them. So you gave like a nice overview of like exactly the play. And, and if anyone wanted to, they could, you could try and like rewind and like, and stop and pause and, and go do it. But we're going to go over it again, just kind of step by step. So let's start with just the SERP, like what, when you're on Google, exactly what are you searching for? And then how are you using SEO Minion to kind of mine that information from people? Yeah, for sure. So in most cases, I think now, like there's, there's a, there's a, a site that tracks the, like how often people also ask or shown, and it's just going up and up and up. So most keywords are going to trigger that. But if for some reason your keyword does not trigger, people also ask, just put what is in front of your main keyword, and then you'll start to get those questions. And basically you install that SEO minion plugin. So go to seominion.com and just go to the Chrome store from there and then install that plugin. And then when you're on the SERP itself, when you're on the search results, you can basically it'll be over, like SEO minion will be overlaid onto the right hand side. And then you would just click expand. So you can expand five results, 10 results, 20 results up to 200 results, and then click go. And then, so if you click 200 results, it'll just start like, you'll see it before your eyes, just continuing to open up that accordion menu. I would probably start with like 20 or 50. If you go to 200, you might end up kind of getting some irrelevant results, but basically once you're, once it's done expanding all that, it's going to copy it to your clipboard and then just head over to Excel or Google sheet and paste those results in. So you'll be pasting the people also ask question, the title tag, the URL and the meta description, I believe. So you have four columns for all of that. And then from there, if you want to see which of those people also ask topics are getting the most traffic to them, you can take those URLs and put them into a tool like Ahrefs, which has a, has a thing called batch analysis, where you can just dump up to 200 URLs and get a bunch of valuable data on those URLs. So you, you the things that you would want to look for there are like number of keywords that the page is ranking for and the total estimated traffic. And then from there, you can export that and then start to filter the pages that do have the most traffic 
and then, you know, look at and see what topics basically overlap with your business or the company that you work for. Nice. Okay, cool. So start, you're starting on the SERP, you're getting this Chrome extension, you're using what is to make sure that you capture all of the people also ask actually quick pause there. If you don't use what is, is the danger that you'll just have less people also ask questions? Um, the, the danger is either you, if you don't use what is, you might not trigger PAAs at all. But I, what I'm saying is like today, like the Google is using them so often that you'll probably trigger it. But just in case you don't, you can always use what is. Gotcha. Okay. So if it's not working with the original keyword, then that could be the trick. Okay. So then you use SEO minion to download all of those downloads it into a spreadsheet, gives you lots of valuable information. You're going to check for duplicates on the URLs. Um, and then you're going to take, uh, those like pared down URLs and you're going to put them into the batch analysis on Ahrefs and you're going to use that to get valuable data. Actually, let's, let's pause on this part. Like what specifically in Ahrefs what data like are you keeping your eyes open to because there's a few different ways that you could go about it on how how you use that data right like are you going to try and go for like the the heavy hitters or are you going to try and go for like the low-hanging fruit so i'll pause there and and just kind of let you answer that one yeah so there's a couple of things you can do to improve your chances for replicating a topic and being successful with it. So the the thing that that I've done in the past, which has worked really well, and I've had a note on my email list, SEO notebook, where I just email like a piece of strategy every week. And one of the notes was to basically put these PAAs into Ahrefs and filter by traffic, and then also sort those rows by their domain rating. So a site with a low domain rating means that it's a site with not very many links and it's most likely a newer site. So if you see a newer site with a bunch of traffic for a keyword that, that um, is triggering PAAs and is also ranking, that is like a very prime opportunity for you to create a piece of content because, you know, you see it right in front of your eyes that this, you know, site that's not mature at all is is able to rank with a very thin backlink profile and just on the merits of the content itself so um, you can identify some really easy wins there that are going to be closely related to what you do nice and so then from there do you just take it at face value or then you go to the SERP and you kind of like check out like the real competition there yeah, you can always, um, so when, once you're in Ahrefs, I feel like we're like really, I don't know how, how tactical your audience is, but we're really getting into the weeds today, but I love it. You know, you, once you're in Ahrefs and you're on that batch analysis screen, you can click things like the traffic or the keywords, and then you can dig into the actual performance of that page. So you can start looking at what are the main keywords that are driving traffic to those pages. And then from there, you know, Ahrefs is a very deep tool. Um, you can actually view like the top 10 results in the SERP all from within Ahrefs and then start looking at their associated metrics. And then of course, like I'm also a huge advocate of, uh, of going to the SERP and looking at it for yourself. Nice. No, I love the breakdown. And to answer your question too, like I think there there are a few like SEO, like hardcore SEOs that listen to this that I know appreciate it. Slash uh, premise is like I do want to like get tactical on, on every episode, which is part of, part of the reason I wanted to to have you on. So yeah, so I think if if people walk away and they're like, I get it, like I understand how to how to leverage people also ask, and I'm gonna do this strategy today, like that's that's the win. So I want to make sure that there's no uh, uh, just like rock uncovered here. So Cool. Uh, I think we walked through like that exact strategy. Next question was basically, all right, so this is, this is starting to get me traffic. Well, I'll pause there for a second because how long did it take like in your, in past experiments with this past clients to start getting traction for this? Yeah. So my biggest case study with people also ask is definitely fresh books. I, prior to becoming a freelance consultant, I had worked at fresh books for about two years. And then I ended up actually being a consultant for FreshBooks after I left the company as an employee in 2020. But when I was there, my boss had come up to me, this guy named Chris Cisco. He's just like the most awesome guy and was like a huge part of the success there. And he came up to me and said, Steve, I need a thousand articles. 
And then he walked away and that's all he said to me. Right. So he was just like, I was like, okay, well, I'm, you know, like I have a content background. So like, you know, he, he knew who he, who, who he was coming to, but I also had no idea where to start at that time to produce a thousand articles. Right. So, and he literally just came up and said it to me and then walked away. So, you know, that was obviously like a huge challenge. And I thought like, Hey, what can I, you know, do? And then I think I was, it was like that cliche moment. I was like in the shower and I was like, people also ask, like, we got to do it. Like that, that's, that's where we start. Right. So we started mining. People also ask questions around accounting, invoicing, entrepreneurship, taxes, all those things closely related to FreshBooks. And we, you know, got thousands of them. And at the time it was a very manual process to sort of cluster them all together. We basically had the the main PAA that had some search volume as the H1. And then we had like two or three related PAAs as H2 headings in each page. And we created this massive spreadsheet. We didn't end up producing a thousand articles, but we produced 650. We hired five writers to come into the building and do nothing but write for three months. And out of that, we got 650 articles. I trained those writers and then we ended up publishing them and then we published 650 articles in one month. Like we didn't drip them out. We just literally got them published as fast as possible. And then a year later, those articles were earning 50,000 clicks a day. Nice. From the 650. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So definitely works on, on the traffic side. And this is also like one of the first, it sounds like projects that you did too. And so where were you guys at that time? Like in terms of like domain authority and just traffic to your blog? The proximate traffic to the blog prior to that was probably around 9,000 a month or something like that. Like not a lot, but maybe a little more than that. I don't actually remember to be honest, but it wasn't, it wasn't a lot. And we prior to launching this, people also ask experiment, really. We didn't know what, what it was going to do. We had, we had launched a 110 page cluster on invoice templates. That was a much more lower mid, almost bottom funnel in some cases play where, whereby, you know, people were signing up for free trials and, and using fresh books to send invoices instead of invoice using an invoice template, which is what they initially came there for. Okay. So you kind of use these things in tandem. The people also ask and the templates and played off each other. And that was really like, sounds like the basis, like of the strategy, like the initial strategy at FreshBooks, uh, cause the yeah, 9,000 is not like not huge before that. It's not nothing, but like, that's kind of what helped you take off. Yeah. We had prioritized the invoice template stuff and we actually ended up ranking number one for about two years on invoice template, which is a 300,000 search per month keyword. And at, at its peak, the page was earning uh, like $42,000 worth of traffic each week. So, you know, it was a, there was a lot of ROI there and I can't mention the specific trial numbers, but we definitely broke records at FreshBooks with those pages. And then with the PAA stuff, the resource hub section of FreshBooks, if anybody wants to check it out, we drove. I think, I don't know, like the newsletter signups, we were driving like 300 a day to the, to the newsletter. And when we actually did the math on the approximate value of the link that we earned through those pages, it was more than the spend that it cost to produce them. Okay. I'm trying not to, to get too derailed by this because now I'm really interested in this, uh, in this strategy as well. So I'll, I'll do a brief tangent for, for the audience, but ma again, mainly for myself. So is that because you were driving so much traffic, like just to the blog and you happen to have like a, an email capture there for the newsletter as well. Like you're saying, like just from the traffic, like you were able to just build the email list off that. Yeah. From 50,000 a day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, this goes into the next question of basically, I was going to say, okay, traffic is great, but at the end of the day revenue, right? So you've already addressed this with basically free trials, broke broke records with free trials. But then on top of that, the thing I think that's not talked about maybe as much in SEO is also capturing those emails, like also just building the list. And so going back to the why SEO in a saturated market in 2022 with all these other strategies, it's like 
that snowball effect, right? That everybody is looking for charts like that, that look like this, that like are up and to the right. And so getting, getting that going, having a cumulative effect, and then it's built, yeah, building traffic in general that almost inevitably, like if you're going after the right keywords will lead to trials, which will lead to revenue. Right. And then third is just building the email list so we're actually like wrapping this up with i would say like more benefits than i would have thought uh going into this of you know those like three things from seo i think we're like you know traffic like most people at this point like know the value of traffic investors like even even like seeing traffic and stuff by itself but ultimately like does it drive revenue does it drive other business impact and i think you're basically saying yes right so so that's like the why why do you do it outside of traffic and then the the other thing that i wanted to cover off on to just come full circle with making sure we go through the entire strategy and everything that you would need is tools. So like tools and people, you talked about this a little bit with, you know, five riders in a room for three months and like you had to train them. So talk to me a little bit about like, once you have the strategy in place, you know, like what keywords to go after, how are you turning those into briefs? Like, are you literally just taking those keywords and those are basically the, the topics for each? Are you putting it in a specific format? How did you think about the briefs? Like, how did you hand them off to your riders in a way that like the execution was successful? Yeah. Yeah, good question. So, you know, in my own consulting practice now, I'm not producing 650 articles in three months. So I have more time to produce like detailed briefs and actually structure more of the article, like the way that I want to, like, you know, adding FAQs or, you know, just basically, yeah, constructing an outline that's really going to guide the writer. But when you're doing 650 articles, you don't really have that luxury. So, you know, we, we had to, we basically had to wrangle all those people also ask questions in a massive spreadsheet and try to group them together into themes. And, you know, today you could do that same exercise with a tool like keyword Cupid, which is done by a friend of mine. And it basically will cluster all those keywords and group them together in exactly the way that they should, that's uh, all automated. But when we basically had that, had those writers come in, we produced a spreadsheet where the column A was the H1, column B, C, and D were the related people also asked questions um, that were, you know, your H, H2s. And then we might've had some reference links and it was pretty bare bones, right? It was just basically like you, they would just pick a row on the spreadsheet one day or two, two rows and tackle two articles and, and then, you know, produce them. So we also used a tool called texttools.net. I think it's text-tools.net. I don't use it anymore, but at the time in 2018, when we did this, it was one of the tools that I was using. And basically that does something called TF-IDF analysis and tells you, you know, what keywords exist on all of the sort of top 10 pages and which keywords you need to be using as well. I think it stands for text frequency inverse document frequency. Nice. Okay. So to give an overview on like the tools specifically, so you, you have Google, you need Google <laughs> and, uh, you have SEO minion as a Chrome extension, you have Ahrefs and then you're bringing in keyword Cupid. And then you mentioned one more at the, at the end that I'm. Yeah. Using. Text tools is what we used at the time. Tools like surfer market news could probably do a better job of that today. Perfect. But they weren't okay. around. I, 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 when I talk about 2018, I feel like it was an ancient time with SEO because SEO evolved so quickly. And there's all these amazing tools now that, you know, we had to find sort of like makeshift solutions back in the day. Yeah. I mean, you're giving away your age a little bit. I wasn't, I wasn't going to say anything, but. Uh, 2018. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy how much like the game has changed. And so if you're doing it today, like how would you use those other tools that you mentioned, you know, like phrase or, or market muse or those other ones? Yeah. So, um, I would, if I was doing it today, I would definitely use keyword Cupid to cluster all of those keywords. I would probably also use Python to mine all of the people also ask questions because Python developers are honestly like no offense, but like a dime a dozen on Upwork and you can get people to do pretty much anything you need to automate for relatively cheaply and um, use Python to uh, give it a seed list of keywords and then extract, you know, thousands of PAs and then cluster those with keyword Cupid for relatively efficient cost. 
And then from there, you would basically get like a large spreadsheet of all the different PAAs grouped together. And then for the main one, the sort of central PAA, I would probably use either Surfer or Phrase, depending on, on what the writer's preference was as well. But both of those tools do a great job in helping construct briefs for, for SEO. Beautiful. Okay. So I think we covered off on everything, just like tools, why, why you would do this, when you would do this, uh, anything else that you feel like we, we missed as we were going through this? Oh yeah. There's like, there's a ton, like there's, you know, I feel like we should have done a screen share on this podcast, <laughs> but not that, um, most listeners are probably listening to it, but you know, there's, yeah, with, with fresh books, we really, um, you know, I was working in house at the time for that company. It was the only website. Well, I mean, I did freelance quite a bit towards the end, but you know, for most of that, it was the sole website that I focused on. You know, it was, uh, it was really like a very, very in-depth, you know, year and a half of, of ranking for invoice template, and then also producing these resource hub pages. So there's, you know, a ton of around conversion rate optimization, link building, you know, little tricks and stuff that we did, but on the overall level, the PA strategy was extremely successful. And then, you know, just on the high level to touch on the invoice template stuff. We basically verticalized those keywords into 110 pages. So we had invoice templates for graphic designers, for contractors, for lawyers, for, you know, 109 other professions, right? So doing that kind of SEO is also extremely productive. If you can um, take your keyword, put the word F O R into the search bar and then click a space and see if like your keyword for, and if that starts to populate like different industries and whatnot, you can have a lot of success in doing that same type of verticalized strategy for a keyword. Nice. Well, I'm going to get messages now about like, oh, you have to have him back on to talk specifically about that templates now because he left us hanging there, but uh, I couldn't have planned it better. So what I'll do though, is link out to your note where you specifically talk about people also ask you like in podcast here. And yeah, hopefully, hopefully drive some, tra just some traffic to you. Uh, it's, it's also a benefit, uh, benefit of doing this. So what advice, I guess, last question, what advice would you give to marketing teams, uh, looking to grow from like, you know, zero to 50 K daily on the upside, uh, or just looking to grow in general, but starting this strategy, people also ask, I think you've pretty much covered everything, but what are the blockers that you see people just getting started? Well, actually, you know, your ability to pitch your executives and get the kind of funding that you would need for an effort like that is extremely valuable. I mean, I, I remember vividly going to an executive offsite for FreshBooks and pitching for um, incremental budget increase. And I wore, I had a t-shirt made that was had the word SEO with a dollar sign in gold lettering. And I, and I wore that to the executive offsite and I just went up and did my presentation and I got some laughs and like some people just talking amongst each other. And that's where we got the incremental budget increase to do the people also asked strategy. So, um, whether or not you want to use my specific tactic with the shirt or just, you know, try to make the case internally for, you know, going after a large scale SEO effort, you're going to want to find, you're going to want to basically budget for something like an SEO consultant who's done this before, of course, I would recommend myself, but if I'm available and then, you know, how much are the writers going to cost? What is the web development lift going to look like? What is your design lift going to look like? Who's going to upload all that content? Um, are you going to be doing link building? We did not do any active link building for that people also ask strategy, but we did definitely do it for the invoice template strategy, you know, factor all those things in and then go in with your ask, right? So when it's time for, you know, you to get your budget requests in, really have your ducks in a row. Nice. Yeah. I think the summary for that for me is like internal marketing, right? So like, don't, don't sleep on internal marketing of ability to just uh, pitch like your, your value as like a, a content marketer, as an SEO in being able to, to move the business forward and just pitch it as like an actual business case. Right. And not just a fun project that you want to do. Yeah. What we actually did at FreshBooks and when we did the big people also ask, and those writers came into the building for three months, we had somebody from our customer support department we pulled him off of customer support 
And he helped us manage all those writers and all the articles and everything, categorize everything and just make sure everything was on track. So he actually stopped being a customer support person for three months to come and help us with this. And then later on, he made his way uh, to the marketing department as a pro project manager. But yeah, maybe also you can look to um, who else's help you can get from within the company to help you execute an effort like that. Nice. I mean, like that's, that's a perfect example though, of like true executive buying. Like it's one thing to be like, here's some money. And then it's uh, some other thing to be like, oh, we're willing to give up other resources from other parts of the business because we know this is important. Right. And you know, we're, we're willing to just sort of like make that bet. Um, and so getting everybody sort of bought into the bet is important. And I've seen that in different places within the business, not just part content marketing. Yeah, definitely helps a lot. Cool. Well, I mean, I've learned a ton and I'm going to have to listen to this episode like a couple times over to get everything from it. But next steps is just how can people find you? Um, how can people hire you? Tell me all the things. Yeah. So if you just like what you heard and you want more cool strategy like that, um, I email once a week on seonotebook.com and have 11,000 subscribers with this episode being recorded in mid-March 2022. And it's a list that has grown very fast in about two and a half years now. And uh, it's grown completely organically. So if you want to sign up for my email updates, it's just seonotebook.com. Uh, you can also contact me through the site if you wish or respond to one of my notes. And then uh, I'm also the founder of a company called gscore.io which is a WordPress plugin that connects to Google Search Console and helps you optimize your existing content with keywords from Google Search Console, all from within the WordPress dashboard. So this is a strategy that I haven't talked about much on this episode, but it's basically enriching your content with your own data. And I've had a ton of success with it. So that's why I've invested heavily into a WordPress plugin. And we're currently in beta right now. You can sign up for the waitlist at gscore.io and you'll be notified as soon as it goes live. Beautiful. Well, yeah, I can personally vouch for Steve. He's both knows what he's talking about, but also just a good guy. And that email list, going back to like the benefits of email list with SEO, like I've I've seen like that that chart. You post that as well, and it looks very similar to your SEO charts, where it's just up and to the right. So uh, another plug there for just if you want more of these types of tactics. Check out his newsletter. So I actually don't even know what to call SEO notebook because it's not really a newsletter. Like it, it's not like you know your top 10 news roundups for this week. It's just literally one piece of very tactical strategy that I've curated. I don't plan what I publish on SEO notebook. I literally just come up with it that week. I sort of do have a queue of possible things that I could talk about, but it's always easier for me to write the note if I'm inspired by something that week. So the note could literally be like 200 words or even less, but it's just to give you an idea of something that you can try. It's basically a Patreon for people that are trying to figure out what's what's going on. He's essentially giving away like a page, Patreon for free. And I could say that being in like a couple of myself, it's very like valuable, actionable information. So definitely sign up for that while, while it's still free. And yeah. Yeah, it'll always be free. Well, there you go. There you go. The notes don't get published anywhere else. You have to be on the list. And that's actually one uh, thing I should mention, which I didn't. If you buy my WordPress plugin, when it comes out, you'll get access to my entire archive of over a hundred notes. So there you go. There you go. No, yeah, I have, that's true. I've tried to search for it before and it's, it's like exclusive to the email. So you know what you're doing. It's working clearly. So yeah, thank you again, Steve, for coming on and we'll have to chat soon. All right. Thanks so much, Camille. Thanks for listening to Content Logistics. This episode is produced by Motion, a done-for-you B2B podcasting agency for busy marketers. If you liked what you heard, please follow the show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.